It's such a pleasure to be standing here in front of you. Uh, so delighted to be here in this beautiful building on a wonderful summer day. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me and to Spitfire for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, as Mark noted, a couple years ago I wrote this book called The Hidden Brain, which looks at the different ways in which unconscious factors affect us in everyday life. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about uh, two or three of those ideas that, that are drawn from how the hidden brain affects communication today. <clears throat> I'm especially honored to be here because um, I'm the third speaker in this series, and the first two speakers, Dan Kahan and Sendhil Mulainathan, have both been heroes to me for a very long time for doing some of the most creative and rigorous, em empirically rigorous work that looks at human behavior. And so it's a real honor for me to be standing here, third in line, uh, behind them. Uh, one of the things I did uh, in this last week was I went back and listened to the talks that Dan and Sandal had given. And I would actually urge you to go back and listen to their talks after you have heard me speak today. Because as I listened to them, I realized that in many ways, we're actually circling around some of the same ideas and circling around them from different perspectives. And I think going back and listening to them will give you sort of this, you know, Rashomon type effect where you're sort of looking at the same, idea, same issue from sort of different perspectives. But it also raises a larger issue, which is human behavior is extremely complex. And almost anything emphatic that you can say about human behavior can be contradicted because people don't behave in predictable and simple ways. And so as you listen to my talk today, uh, I'm hoping that you will not hear it as gospel. I'm not giving you, you know, the three simple ways in which human behavior can be understood and controlled here or not, because that simply isn't possible to do. I'm hoping that you will see it rather as really the start of a conversation that we can continue after my talk is over, but to also think about it in, as, as, a, as a nuanced issue, that there are actually multiple, multiple nuances to all of the issues I'm going to talk about. Um, and so don't take my word as gospel. So in ways large and small, all of us are communicators in everyday life. So Memorial Day weekend just came and went, and perhaps you, like many other people in the country, went off uh, to the beach or wherever you go on Memorial Day. And let's say you were driving back on the Monday night, along with everybody else who decided to drive back on the Monday night, and you got caught in this huge, terrible traffic jam. And your partner, who's driving in the car, decides at some point that, the hell with it, I can't stay, stay, sit in this traffic jam any longer. He gets off the road, he says, I know my way, I'm gonna go off into the back roads, and I'm gonna find my way. <laughs> it's getting dark now. 45 minutes later, you're in God knows where, you're getting more and more lost, and no amount of communication or persuasion to your partner gets you anywhere. Now, he, of course, doesn't believe in carrying around a GPS navigation device because <laughs> he believes the sense of navigation is infallible and no amount of persuasion and telling him, look, we're lost, we need to do something different. The same thing happened last Memorial Day. <laughs> None of it works. You see the same thing on a macro scale. We've just completed the 2012 election, and I just saw a report that said, we've spent something like $6 billion on the 2012 election. Now, in Washington, we use the word billion so casually that we sometimes forget what a big number a billion actually is. Is the microphone? Yeah, I'm sorry. Terribly sorry. sorry. That's Just okay. Put, put this on. Would you rather I stayed behind the podium? No, no, that's fine. You don't mind walking. Okay. Is this live too? Uh, Do we know if it's It should right? be, but this is fine. Okay. If you don't mind. This is down. Okay. So. We've just completed, so all of the people listening remotely haven't heard the best part of my speech, <laughs> which was just completed. I'm so sorry. You're going to have to ask the people in the room what happened. Anyway, I was talking about how in ways large and small, we're not very effective at communicating in everyday life. And I gave an example just now of you know, an interpersonal communication that didn't go very well. But think about the 2012 election. Right? We've spent $6 billion on the 2012 election, which is $6,000 million. $6,000,000. That's a lot of money. Now, if you're a Republican, you could say, yes, it's a lot of money, but look, at the end of the day, we still had control of the House, and it was worth spending. That's how much it costs to run an election. Now, if you're a Democrat, you could say, 
Yes, it's a lot of money, but you know, we get control of the White House, we kept control of the Senate, and those are worth fighting for. And if you're a pundit or a political consultant, you could say, yes, it's a lot of money, but that's just the way elections are these days. That's how much it costs to run an election. I want you to think about a fourth perspective today. What would a scientist say if she heard that you've spent $6,000 million, and at the end of the day, the occupant in the White House stays in the White House, the party in control of the Senate keeps control of the Senate. They don't increase their majority to a filibuster-proof majority. They just keep their majority. The party in control of the House keeps control of the House. The scientist would say it's at least plausible that much of those $6,000 million that was spent accomplished very little. Now, I'm not necessarily saying the Democrats and the Republicans and the political consultants are wrong. It may well be that that's how much it costs to run an election. But I think it actually it's beyond dispute that a lot of the money we spend on big national campaigns, on big elections, a lot of it probably is wasted. It's ineffective. So why is that? There's a second dimension at work here. If you look at this uh, slide up here, this shows us uh, how the US Senate has voted over a 30-year period. This was data compiled by the National Journal. Uh, and what it shows is as of 2011, the most conservative Democrat is to the left of the most liberal Republican. Now, you might say that actually makes sense because the Democrats are mostly liberals, the Republicans are mostly conservatives. But if you look historically, that's actually not the case. If you look in 1982, for example, the most conservative Democrat is way over here. The most liberal Republican is way over here. There was much more ideological diversity within each of the parties than there seems to be right now. And this is a puzzle, because if you think about what the parties represent, you would actually expect that there would be a lot of ideological diversity, because the parties, both the major parties, are tense for a very large set of different issues. So think about the issues that define our parties today. Right? You have debates over taxes versus the safety net, or a debate about abortions, or debates about guns, or debates about gay rights. There's no strong reason why all the people who believe on this issue should line up neatly under the same tent. You see what I mean? That there's no reason why if you have to be in favor of lower taxes, you would also necessarily be more religious. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. Those issues don't hang together. And yet, if you look at the major parties, you find that they're not only very good at the elite level, at who's representing us in Congress, but at the everyday level. Ordinary people, if you're a Republican, you tend to believe everything in the Republican platform. If you're a Democrat, you tend to believe everything on the Democratic platform. And so the idea that these issues hang together so well, it's implausible that this can happen just by sheer chance or random, random chance. I think I see here the hand of bias, or at the very least, the hand of psychology. So two issues to keep in mind. One, much of our communications is ineffective. And secondly, in terms of how large numbers of people believe the various issues that they think are very important, bias or psychology seems to play a very powerful role. So what are some of those reasons? How, how can we better understand why, these, uh, why communication is ineffective and how people form their opinions? So when you think about campaigns, um, often campaigns involving uh, appeals to the common good, uh, this is campaigns, for example, on environmental issues, what they will often tell you is to say, pay attention to what's in the collective interest. Pay attention to what's in the common good. So a lot of what the campaigns do is try and tell people, look beyond your self-interest, pay attention to what is in the collective interest. Right? So in the environment, these environmental campaigns, you know, our planet, our place, our planet, our responsibility. Think, by contrast, about the ads here, also run by a different advocacy group. What will you do to end the silence? And as you watch these two ads, I want you to actually pay attention to what's happening inside your own minds. So when it comes to human behavior, we all carry a little guinea pig around with us, and that guinea pig is us. <laughs> pay attention to how you yourself are thinking about these ads. Does one of these sets of ads prompt you to say, I need to get up and do something? Or is one of them, are they both equivalent? Think about how they affect you, and think about why it might be they affect you in that way. A couple months ago, I uh, did a story for NPR that looked at the work of a social scientist at Stanford University called Mariam Hamadani, and she studies cross-cultural issues. And one of the ideas she was exploring is she said, if you look at American history, if you look at our culture, 
if you look at the people who become our movie stars and the heroes in our novels and our books, what you will often find is that there's a very strong strain in America of independent-minded thinking, that in America, the idea of independence is a foundational idea, perhaps more than in any other country in the world. The idea of liberty and personal autonomy are really foundational to who it is, what it is to be an American. So she said, and this was based on some earlier work that has also uh, explored this area, what happens when you ask people who are steeped in the language of individual liberty to subsume their self-interest, to subsume their sense of autonomy, and think about the common good? What happens if you ask people who are independent-minded to set aside their independence and think about the common good? And she ran a set of experiments where she brought people in, volunteers, and she primed them, which is psychological speak for subliminally induced them, to think about concepts that are either, uh, that activated concepts of independence or concepts of interdependence. Concepts of independence or interdependence. And then she gave them a bunch of physical and mental tasks to do. And what she found was very interesting. She found that at least for a subset of the volunteers, being primed to think interdependently, think about collective, greater good, the common interest, lowered their ability to function well on mental and physical tasks. So one of the tasks they gave, she gave them was, for example, a test of hand grip strength. You know, if you're holding a, a, you know, weights in the gym, how, how much, how tightly can you hold on to this and how long can you hold on to it? And she found that when she primed the volunteers to think interdependently, they were able to hold on less often. They were able to exert less strength or for less amount of, less amount of time. So we say, all right, so that's about hand grip strength. So why should we care about that? This is not this lecture and this conversation is not about hand grip strength. We don't really care about that. Hamidani said, how does this affect policy issues? How does this affect how people think about policy questions? And so she said, let's imagine a situation where Stanford University is thinking of starting a new course that places environmental issues and environmental sustainability at the heart of the curriculum, that it's going to be essential for all students to learn about environmental issues. It's going to be an essential part of your experience at Stanford. She again primed the volunteers to think independently and interdependently. And what she found, and she asked, how much do you think the university should get behind such an effort as a way to measure how much people thought the issue was important? How much, how much money do you think the university should invest per student to make this course a central part of the curriculum. And what she found was very interesting. She found that when it came to some subgroups, so if the Asian, Asian Americans here are in blue, when it came to Asian Americans, being primed to think interdependently did what you and I might expect it would do, which is that when you prime the Asian Americans to think interdependently, they became more willing to support an environmental cause, that so they're more willing to support a cause where the university puts more resources behind an issue. But she found with European Americans, it worked very differently. That priming them to think interdependently significantly lowered their willingness to get behind that program. And on the other hand, priming them to think independently made them much more willing to get behind a program. So in other words, it's the same program, it's the same message, but the question is, are you putting people in a frame of mind where you're talking in ways that are consistent with their inner values or talking in ways that are disconsonant with their inner values, right? And so what she's basically exploring is this idea, a very old idea in psychology, an idea called cognitive dissonance, which is that, you know, people don't like being pulled in multiple directions at the same time. And so when you communicate to people, if you don't communicate your message in a way that's consistent or consonant with their values, even if they agree with you on the issues, they're much less likely to support you. Does that make sense? So uh, when you look at American culture, independence is really foundational from the founding documents of our nation to the heroes and the stories we tell. We really focus on the independent individual. Taken together, our studies show that, um, in fact, interdependent behavior can be a barrier to motivation for European Americans, and that um, this can have important consequences in terms of how they support social issues. So when you think about policy messages, that was a short excerpt from something from an interview I conducted with Hamadani. Uh, when you think about your messaging campaigns and so on, how often do you ask yourself, is my message, separate from whether people will agree with the message or not, are the values embedded in my message consistent 
with the values of the people that I'm speaking with. Now, it's entirely possible, and even in a group like this, 200 people sitting in front of me, the values of the people here are going to be very different. You're all not going to share the same values, so it's possible that your message might need to change depending on who you're speaking with. But think about very often how we communicate the messages, and sometimes the mixed messages we send at the level of values when we communicate about important issues. So um, this is President Obama right uh, after the Newtown school shootings where he called for stricter gun control legislation. And I want you to listen to a short excerpt of something that, that the president said, but listen to it now with the context of saying, what are the values that are being activated in different parts of his message? Listen. This is the land of the free, and it always will be. As Americans, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that no man or government can take away from us. But we've also long recognized, as our founders recognized, that with rights come responsibilities. Along with our freedom to live our lives as we will comes an obligation to allow others to do the same. We don't live in isolation. We live in a society, a government of and by and for the people. We are responsible for each other. So if you listen to that message, there are really multiple values being activated. So he starts out basically talking about how we're the land of the free and we're always going to be. But then he also pivots to basically say, look, we have these other obligations to one another. And both of those are embedded in the same message. Now, at a messaging level, that doesn't feel irrational. But at the level of how you're speaking to people's values, it may well be that one part of the message resonates with them, but the other part of the message does not resonate with them. So if you think, for example, on the other side of this issue, on the issue of guns, if you think about how the gun rights movement frames the issue, I think what you will find is far more consistent messaging on the idea that gun rights speak to questions involving autonomy, liberty, freedom. That on a consistent basis, what you will hear across the spectrum from people who advocate for gun rights is that this is an American tradition. These are American values. This is American autonomy. You see the flag. You see the signs of, you know, signals of patriotism. The messaging, the values, in some ways, are more consistent with the way many people might think about, you know, their own behavior. So when you think about the issues that I <clears throat> mentioned a little while ago, um, there's a way to think about these issues now, not as sort of policy questions, but in terms of this values that are being, that Hamadani is talking about. And if you look at all of these issues, I think they actually break down in a kind of interesting way. So on the question of safety net versus lower taxes, I would argue the people arguing for lower taxes are speaking the language of individual rights and individual autonomy. That, you know, every man for himself, sort of. That, you know, the, uh, the safety net is much more an argument about the common good and shared responsibility. If you think about Abortion, on the other hand, the people arguing that a woman has the right to choose are speaking the language of individual autonomy, that it's the up to the individual to decide what he or she wants to do. And the people who are against uh, abortion rights, the pro-life groups, are speaking much more about tradition, values, our shared sense of responsibility. So these issues don't necessarily break down in a left-right kind of manner. There are issues on which the left espouses individual autonomy, and there are issues on which the right espouses individual autonomy. On the question of gun control and gun rights, I think it's very clear that the side that's arguing for gun rights is speaking the language of autonomy. And the like, people who are arguing for gun control are saying we should control that autonomy. We should control how much we're able to express our individual autonomy. On defense issues, it's a little more complicated, but I would argue that the people who see you know, the lone soldier climbing up the hill and planting the flag at the top of the hill, you know, that message or that idea is much more consistent, I think, with hawkish views on military issues compared to you know, an anti-war position on military issues. With religious, on religious versus secular ideas, the people arguing in favor of secular values are clearly speaking much more the language of individual liberty. On the question of gay rights, beyond the question, the people arguing in favor of gay rights are making an argument in favor of individual liberty. Whereas the people, their opponents, are basically saying, no, there are larger traditions, there are larger obligations, there are things that we have that should oppose them. Now, you may not necessarily agree with the way that I have divided these issues, or you might not also agree with which version or which side I believe is ascendant, but I believe on multiple of these issues, the side that is espousing the cause of individual liberty and individual autonomy 
is increasingly ascendant, that you're much more likely to have an effective message when you're arguing the language of individual liberty. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that if you're an environmental group, you, you know, espousing individual values doesn't mean now you can tell people, all right, go out and trash the planet because that's individual liberty. That's not what I'm saying. Your message can still be what your message wants it to be, but in terms of the values you're espousing in the message, those values can be tailored to either activate concepts of interdependence or concepts of independence. Um, I grew up in India, and I read and know a great deal about Mahatma Gandhi's life, but I had never come by this quote from Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world, until I came to the United States. <laughs> now, I'm not necessarily saying that Gandhi didn't say this. I'm not, suggesting, <laughs> I'm not suggesting the quote was fabricated. I'm sure Gandhi said it. But he also said a great many things that talked about shared responsibility. You know, he once said, if you ever have any doubts about how you should behave in everyday life, think about the poorest and the most wretched person you've ever met in your life and ask if your actions would be good for that person or bad for that person. But that's not the kind of quote that gets popular in the United States, <laughs> right? The reason this quote resonates so much in the United States is partly because Gandhi said it, yes, but partly also because the quote resonates with a deeply held American value, the value for independent thinking, for autonomy. <clears throat> Here's a second issue. When we message on, when we give out messages that often involve humanitarian causes, disease or hunger or malnutrition, one of the rules of thumb we often use is the idea that we need to communicate how big the problem is. And at a certain level, that's perfectly logical. Because if you can say 10 people are suffering from a problem, or a million people are suffering from a problem, clearly telling people that a million people are suffering from a problem ought to be a more effective message, because many more people are in need of help. Right? Think about the message. Hunger and malnutrition are still the number one risks to health worldwide, a sense of the scale of the problem. Well, think about this. Every 3.6 seconds, uh, a person dies of hunger. 75% of them are children. Now, in the gap between my last two sentences, if that last statistic is correct, someone in the world may have died of hunger. Why are you all still sitting here listening to me? Isn't there something more important that you should be doing? I just told you a horrifying statistic, and if the statistic is true, it suggests that on a routine, everyday basis, huge numbers of people are dying from something that is entirely preventable. Go back to that guinea pig inside your head and ask yourself, at one level, you hear the statistic and you say, my God, that's appalling. But that doesn't necessarily translate into your, into your saying, I want to do something about it. So recognizing that there's a problem doesn't necessarily translate into action. And often what we're looking for is not just intellectual, you know, someone being an intellectual sympathy to what you're saying, but what we're looking for is action. So the philosopher Peter Singer has an interesting dilemma. He said, imagine that you're walking by the side of a pond and you see a child drowning. Now, you can jump into the pond and save the child at no risk to your own life. So there's no, there's no risk that you face in jumping into the pond. However, if you stop to untie your shoes before you jump into the pond, the child will probably drown. So you don't have time to untie your shoes. And you happen to be wearing a very fine pair of shoes that cost $200. <laughs> Would you save the child, or would you save your shoes? Now, when you pose that question to most people, most people say, well, of course I would jump in the pond. A child's life is clearly more important than a pair of shoes. So if that's the case, Singer says, why is it that so, so many fewer of us, or far fewer of us, are willing to write a check for $200 that could save the life of a child halfway around the world? Even when you're absolutely sure the money will be well spent, it's going to a charity with impeccable integrity, even when you're absolutely sure that $200 could indeed save the life of a child, why is it that fewer of us are willing to write that check than to jump in the pond? Singer's point, and it's absolutely right, is that the two issues are identical. In both cases, you're, you're weighing the life of a child versus $200. So over the years, psychologists have explored ideas such as the diffusion of responsibility, which is that many people are potentially responsible for that child over there. I am personally responsible for the child over here. So right now, if I happen to keel over and fall on the ground, you wouldn't just sit there watching me. 
you would actually jump up and do something. You would actually call 911 or run, run up to me and say, do you need help? So when something is immediate before us, it's visceral, we're much more likely to act. So in my book, The Hidden Brain, uh, I explore in one chapter another idea which might explain why it is we're more likely to act in one situation and not in the other. And I call it the telescope effect, which is when you think about what it is that causes people to act, causes people to get up and do something, right? Acting compassionately or acting empathetically requires putting yourself in someone else's shoes. What happens if you're asked to put yourself not in someone else's shoes, but in 10 people's shoes, or a million people's shoes. One of the facets of the way compassion works in the mind is that it works best when it can focus on a single individual. That compassion works when you can target it to a single person. That paradoxically, telling you about 100 people in need of help might induce you to do much less than telling you about one person in need of help. So. Uh, in my book, I write about uh, the story about uh, an Indonesian uh, tanker. It was a diesel tanker that roamed the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there were about 12 people on board with a the, with the dog, the captain's puppy. Uh, a fire broke out in the tanker, and uh, uh, the, the tanker, they lost all communication, all navigation, and so they were adrift on the Pacific Ocean. No one knew where they were. Uh, after about three weeks, a cruise ship came and rescued the crew on the tanker, they happened to come by. But in the confusion involved in the rescue, uh, the puppy got left behind on the tanker. So as the cruise ship pulled away, passengers heard the sound of barking, and they said there's a dog left behind on the tanker. So the cruise ship comes back to Hawaii, and the passenger on the cruise ship calls the Hawaii Humane Society, and the Humane Society says, we have to do something about this puppy that's adrift on this tanker on the Pacific Ocean. So they talk about this, they try and build up publicity, it really catches fire. Donations come in from across the United States, from foreign countries. Some of the checks are for thousands of dollars at a time. They create the search box because they say, based on where the tanker was last seen, we have a 360,000 square mile area in which this tanker could be. And so they press you know, radar and other things to try and find the tanker. They go on for days. They're not able to find it. There's huge pressure on the US government to act. But the US government says, listen, this tanker is in international waters. There's really nothing that we can do about it. But the pressure starts to mount so much that the US Navy, under the guise of a training mission, says, all right, we'll start looking for the tanker. <laughs> the Coast Guard eventually gets involved. They dispatch these very high-tech C-130 aircraft with forward-looking radar systems. And eventually, they find the tanker. It's called the Inseco. And the, 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 the pilots on the, on, this, on the plane, as they fly by the tanker, they see a little blur running across the deck of the tanker, which means that the puppy is still alive. So they don't have food, so they drop their lunches on the tanker, their granola bars and oranges, and, so that the puppy can survive. So now they come back, they tell people about this, you know, interest in the puppy soars to historic proportions immense pressure on the US government to act. So finally, the Coast Guard and the US government say, you know, there's actually an environmental reason why we should get involved in this, because the tanker is carrying diesel. And at this point, the tanker is so far outside the search box, it's about 2,500 miles from the US mainland, drifting west. And they say that if it drifts further west by hundreds of miles, it could run aground on this very tiny speck in the Pacific Ocean called Johnston Atoll, and it could harm the marine life there. And that's an environmental reason why we should get involved and retrieve the tanker. Now, what they don't mention is that for many, many years, the US government used Johnston Atoll as a testing ground for nuclear weapons. <laughs> and so the island is contaminated with plutonium and uranium, and they have nerve agents and sarin. But of course, the diesel on this tanker <laughs> is just too deadly for poor little Johnston Atoll. Anyway, so they find the tanker. The dog is still alive. They bring the tanker back to Hawaii. This is a picture of the dog being welcomed back with a lei. Uh, you know, they play who let the dogs out as the <laughs> dog comes back in. Anyway, in the course of this whole rescue mission, 
at least $100,000 was spent on rescuing this puppy, probably far more than that, probably many times that when you factor in the human costs and the logistical costs and so on. And so for the cost of saving this one puppy, you know, quite obviously, thousands of dogs could have been saved for the same amount of money. Thousands of dogs, right? But that doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen precisely because of the telescope effect, that the reason we cared about this puppy, you know, so people say, why don't we care about the child who's halfway around the world? And people say the child is far away. Well, the dog was far away too. The dog was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This was a foreign dog, actually. It wasn't even an American dog, <laughs> right? So it's not just that we care about Americans. We, you know, the argument is that we don't care about foreigners. We care only about Americans. No, this was a foreign dog on, in international waters. But it was one dog. It was one dog with a face, with a story, with a life history. And that allows us to wrap our compassion around it. And it activates our compassion in ways that if there had been 100 dogs on that very same tanker, we would have been far less likely to have gotten involved. So when you're communicating messages, and many nonprofit groups, I think, understand this, it actually is ineffective to communicate scale. That scale might actually become a disincentive to act, which is why when I often get um, you know, letters in the mail asking me for support, I'm often not told you know, a million people need help. I'm shown a photograph of a single person, and I'm saying, and I'm told, your donations can help this one person do something, that this one person can be helped or saved. I'm much more likely to act in that situation. I'm going to skip over the video here in the interest of time. We can come back to it during the uh, Q&A if necessary. <clears throat> but I want to go to the third topic, which is if you look out at, at, at public life, you see a number of issues on which misinformation is really widespread. And Dan and Sandel talked about this in the earlier talks as well. So right after the 9-11 attacks, for example, significant numbers of Americans believed that the US government was behind the 9-11 attacks and had attacked the World Trade uh, Towers uh, as a pretext for the wars in Iraq. Unsurprisingly, significant numbers of the people who believed that were Democrats. Fewer people who believed that were Republicans. Fast forward eight years, you have significant numbers of people who believe President Obama was not born in the United States. And no amount of information that you can throw at it seems to convince them otherwise. Far fewer of Democrats believe the same thing. So why is that? Now, our standard response when we see misinformation is to hurl information at the problem. We basically say, we'll throw more data, we'll throw more evidence, and that'll fix the problem. But as we've seen from the truther conspiracy theories and the birther conspiracy theories, information, good information, does not drive bad information out of circulation. If anything, it amplifies this, the conviction with which people hold on to the bad information. So why is that? There are lots of different examples of this, by the way. Um, last year, during the presidential election, when gas prices were very high, uh, people were asked, how much control does the president have over high gas prices? And the Republicans here in red, you know, nearly four-fifths of them said the president has a lot of control over high gas prices and isn't doing anything about it. Eight years earlier, when George W. Bush was in the White House, significantly fewer Republicans thought the president had any control over gas prices whatsoever. With Democrats, it's flipped. Fewer of them believe that Obama can do anything about gas prices. More of them believe that George W. Bush could do something about gas prices. So our partisan sympathies shape how we believe the facts work. So this is not surprising. Many of us know that this is, this is the case. The question is, what do we do about it? Because hurling information at the problem clearly does not work. So we talked a little while ago about this theory in psychology called cognitive dissonance. And one of the ideas that many people are playing with is the reason people don't take in information to correct their bad information, that they don't correct their misinformation using evidence, is not because they are against the evidence. It's not because they are stupid. But it's because the bad information is somehow threatening to them. Right? So go back to the person in the car on Memorial Day weekend when you're driving back and you're giving your partner information how you're lost, and he's not listening to you. And no amount of throwing information at the problem solves the problem, right? And the reason it's happening is not because the information isn't good. The problem is your partner is not taking in that information because that information is threatening in some kind of way to the way he sees himself, that he wants to see himself as being a good navigator. It's essential to his self-concept, and being take, to take in this information would be threatening to that. And so people are playing with the idea that the same thing might be happening at a political level, which is that people don't take in information because they find it threatening. Now, 
what some people are trying is to take a lesson out of uh, the books of many psychotherapists, which is when you go into psychotherapy, right, very often it's very clear to another person what you need to do to fix your life. But if the psychotherapist tells you on the first day you come in, look, you need to stop drinking, you need to quit your job, you need to get out of this abusive relationship, you need to move to a new city, the person will walk out and never come back again because they can't take in the information. There's too much there. It's too threatening. And so one of the things a psychotherapist does first is to build up trust, is to build up self-esteem, is to shore up the person's capacity to deal with threatening information. That you can't take in threatening information if it's threatening, but you might be more willing to take in the threatening information once you feel a little more secure. Can the same thing happen when it comes to political information? So Brendan Nyhan at Dartmouth University and other researchers are playing with this idea that if you get people to think about times in their lives when they did something heroic and wonderful, so in the case of your partner in the car, think about some time where he truly found his way in a miraculous fashion, and he managed to find his way even though there were no roads and no signals. You know, He used some kind of pigeon homing sensing, <laughs> and he found his way. Now, if you can get him to think about that, right, and that confirms to him his internal view that he's a very good navigator, he might become more willing in this one instance to say, I can take in information that is threatening. And Nyhan finds this indeed is the case, that if you get people to remember times in their life when they did something really good, when you boost their self-concept, it becomes much more easy for them to take in threatening information. What's interesting is that Thinking about these things in your past where you did something good may have nothing to do with politics. It could be about something completely different. Listen to something that Nihan told me. One person talked about taking care of his elderly grandmother. Something that you wouldn't expect to have any influence on people's factual beliefs about politics. But that brings to mind these positive feelings about themselves, which we think will protect them or inoculate them from the threat that unwelcome information or unwelcome ideas might, might pose to their self-concept. So three ideas here. The first is, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're communicating to people, uh, the, the, the values that are embedded in your message might be very important. Second, communicating scale is not very effective. Third, paying attention to what information people find threatening and finding ways to reduce the threat of that information might be very powerful. One last idea before I stop. When most of us think about bias, we think about other people who have biases. That it's far easier for us to see people from other political parties, other groups, our partners have biases. And it's much harder for us to see those biases in ourselves. Ironically, the one person whom you really have a lot of control over in terms of changing your behavior <laughs> is yourself. Now, as you're listening to my talk, it's understandable that you would say, you're thinking, how can I use this to persuade other people? And there's nothing, <laughs> there, is, there is nothing wrong in that. There is nothing wrong in that. But I would ask you also to think about yourselves as potentially being victims to these biases as well, not just dealing with other people who are victims to the bias, to basically look in the mirror and say, the same biases that I see in other people are probably affecting me as well. Thanks so much.